All right. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining today's Savvy Restaurant Operators Panel Webinar, where we'll be discussing how to improve performance across locations. Unfortunately, one of our two panelists uh, with Cactus Club Cafe had a last minute scheduling conflict, so is not able to join, but we still have a great group of panelists, including McDonald's franchisee, Arthur Foods. So I'll be introducing them in just a moment. We'll jump uh, a couple housekeeping items. We will be recording today's webinar, so we'll follow up via email with the replay. We'll also hopefully have time for Q&A at the end, so feel free to submit any questions you have in the panel of GoToWebinar throughout the presentation. I'll quickly go through today's agenda. <laughs> I'm going to introduce uh, our panelists uh, in just a moment, and then we'll jump into the state of restaurant operations. Before we, uh, we're excited to be kind of giving everyone a sneak peek of some fresh research that was just conducted with Technomics and Zenput. Um, so our 2020 restaurant ops report will have um, some trends, challenges, and opportunities um, coming out of that research that was just conducted. And then again, we hope to have uh, time for, for Q&A. So feel free to submit your questions throughout. All right, and for our panelists today, we're thrilled to be joined by Zimput CEO, Vladik Richter, who can provide a really unique perspective as he's been working with restaurant operators uh, across of many types uh, as he's been building Zimput through the years. We also have David Carroll, our CMO, who will be serving as moderator throughout the presentation. And finally, we're thrilled to be joined by Paul S. Payat, uh, the Vice President of Operations at McDonald's franchisee, Arthur Foods. So with that, Paul, I'm going to let you give a little bit of background about Ortho Foods and your role there. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Espayat, um, as previously mentioned, and just want to give you guys a little bit of background of our organization. We currently own 24 locations across Central Florida, 21 in Orlando specifically, and three in the Polk County, Haines City area. We are well known for having the world's largest entertainment McDonald's, which is located on Sand Lake and International Drive. A little bit of background on myself. Um, I have been with Ortho Foods for 23 years. I've been in my role as a VP of Ops for the last seven years. Um, we are definitely a, we are, we are a QSR um, restaurant and we operate, like I said, 24 restaurants. A couple of our priorities and initiatives that we've been supporting throughout the 2019 year is getting our managers to focus better on running shifts within the restaurant, um, making sure that we engage them on a totally digital platform across all the departments within our organization, from the operations to the accounting and uh, every, every metric you could think of. Uh, one of our biggest initiatives is making sure that we could increase our guest visits through executing on our hospitality our high quality products and our speed of service. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for that intro, Paul. Uh, appreciate that and obviously uh, enjoy working with you. So uh, this is Vladek Rector. I am, um, uh, I'm, as Cassie just so graciously introduced, I'm the, uh, I'm the CEO of Zenfund. So I wanted to give you guys a little bit of, uh, of background on, um, on, uh, on Zenfund itself. Uh, we've been around for a little over seven years. I've personally been in the uh, 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 restaurant and uh, kind of food service retail industry for about uh, 13 or 14 years at this point. Uh, today, we service roughly 40,000 locations in 35, uh, more than 35 countries. Uh, we've got offices ourselves um, in San Francisco, in Atlanta, in, uh, in Mexico, in Ukraine, in the Philippines. So we've got coverage uh, almost globally at this point. And, and roughly 50% of the uh, QSRs uh, in the top 30 um, uh, the top 30 QSRs use Zenput in some variety today, right? It might be a mixture of uh, franchisees, uh, corporate, um, sometimes even both uh, in those cases, and, and usually across uh, across many country lines. Uh, so you can see some of the logos uh, below that we work with. These are probably uh, brands that you're quite aware of, household names that you've been to, um, folks that we enjoy working with on a day-to-day -day basis. But as we um, as we continue to work with uh, with these individuals, um, I want to kind of uh, talk a little bit about uh, in general. The, the, the state of uh, restaurant ops and, and where there are big challenges 
uh, within the uh, uh, within that operators are facing today, right? And we generally hear three that are um, uh, that come up more than others, right? One, there's a, a costly uh, increase in labor and costly wages and turnover. I think most of us are experiencing in whatever city we're living in the U.S. Uh, talks or actual uh, uh, actual uh, legal frameworks that have uh, pushed uh, minimum wage up to $15 an hour. Um, and we hear that a lot from our own uh, from our own customers of the challenges that ends up creating around having to spend the same amount of labor dollars, but actually having the a lot less labor hours uh, within the store itself. Um, continuous uh, lack of visibility across stores. So as we see uh, franchisees growing in the store counts that they operate in, uh, moving from one location to three or four locations, from five locations to 10 or 11, or from 15 up to 25, it becomes difficult uh, to manage across all those and get visibility uh, into the execution uh, within those environments, right? And I think the last piece, uh, which obviously uh, we're all aware of ourselves, is uh, on the on the competitor side and the innovation. Right, and the competitor side being a little bit of a mix, not just um, not just the store down the street or the restaurant down the street that you're competing with, but also everything that's happening with um, uh, with the aggregators and the delivery networks. Right, all of a sudden, instead of um, instead of being able to uh, turn around and uh, only pick out one place to go to eat at, you have a lot of other choices uh, at your fingertips, and it's creating disruption in both. Uh, the ways that uh, we consume food ourselves, but also in the way that the operators, um, operators such as yourselves, are having to compete uh, between the digital and the on on-site premise. Um, as we um, as we start to take a look at uh, the work that we've been doing within our customer base, we've seen a lot of kind of uh, success within uh, and results within uh, the customers today. So, as a whole, this is a uh, uh, things that we've seen from uh, our, our core customers. Uh, we've seen imp improved visibility across locations. So greater than 95% of our customers uh, experience that one way or another. We, uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that they're able to see information, photos, videos, uh, things in real time. Um, the more that this activity continues to happen, the more we see an impact down the line for better customer experiences. Usually that data is being driven by uh, the scores that they're getting from their uh, customer experience uh, feedback surveys. Um, we're seeing increased employee productivity, right? Uh, one of the st uh, natural stories of moving from manual processes to digital processes is that you get rid of um, lots of mundane tasks and you're able to kind of improve the speed at which that they're getting done. And then naturally, uh, from a field level perspective, we see a lot more effective audits, right? So from a district manager perspective, as you're coming in uh, to the environment, you've got a better grasp of what's happening there before you walk in. And instead of just uh, providing kind of uh, feedback about what needs to get fixed, you're spending more time on the training portion of it yourself. Right? So those are key factors within that. Great. All right, thanks, Vlad. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, great to be joining you all on the call today. This is Dave Carroll. Um, as Cassie mentioned, I run marketing here at Zenput. I'm looking forward to a great discussion with Paul and Vlad. And what I wanted to do, just to set some additional context for our conversation, I'm pretty excited to give everyone on the call today a, a first ever sneak peek into a pretty interesting research study um, that we had then put um, team down with Technomic. Um, a little bit about that research. Um, it was based on a survey that we jointly conducted with Technomic in, back in September and October, um, so just a few weeks back. Um, the survey was ran against Technomics panel of restaurant operators. Um, the respondents were both small operators, but we did kind of constrain it to um, operators with more than 10 locations um, and also large operators. And that was across both quick service and full service. Um, we had about 300 operators participating, so a pretty rich set of data that came out of this. And really the crux of what we were after um, we really were looking to better understand the operations execution challenges facing restaurant operators. Um, and we really wanted to dig in to learn like where are operators prioritizing initiatives, um, where are they looking to make progress as they go into the new year here in 2020. Um, so today we're going to give you a teaser into some of just some of the data coming out of it. Um, the full research study will be published in January, so stay tuned for that. So to kick off the conversation, as we see on the slide here, let's talk about some of the things that are getting in the way of effective team execution and driving uh, performance across stores, which is the, uh, the theme of today's conversation. So in the survey, we asked operators to call out what are the top barriers to consistent store execution and customer experiences. Um, and it, interestingly, and maybe coincidentally, kind of with some of the themes that Vlad raised um, earlier based on his conversations with customers, it turns out that all these top barriers are very employee oriented. Um, barriers most frequently cited were rising labor costs, not a big surprise there. 
um, employee turnover. Um, and then feeding off of employee turnover, number three was training, right? How do you keep everyone really well trained up if, when, when employees are turning over so quickly? So Paul, let me, let me turn to you first. So if you look at you know, the past 12 to 18 months, and maybe this might even be prior to engaging with Zenput, what were the, you know, the real tough team execution issues that you were saying? And that might be store execution issues or field execution issues. So when we look at the restaurant level, you know, I couldn't agree more with, with what we have here displayed on the screen. You know, maintaining the employee cost at a profitable number and ensuring that we're not turning over our employees has been the biggest challenge that we faced here in Central Florida, especially with the likes of uh, the big the big competitors that we have with the theme parks here, and everybody has their their situations. I would say that. Moving forward, if we don't focus on our employee training and we do not focus on maintaining those employees, it is going to continue to be an, a growing challenge throughout the industry as a whole, especially in our field of QSR. Great, great. Thanks, Paul. And Vlad, I guess if, if you were to think about in your conversations, um, you know, all the conversations you're having with, with ops leaders, and you're trying to channel some of the themes that you're hearing from them, what might they be? Yeah, I think for the uh, the, the employee part on the, on the turnover side, it's probably one that gets brought up uh, more frequently than others. With the sort of rise of the gig economies, uh, where people can now flexibly work wherever they, whenever they want, wherever they want, uh, getting around to it, you, um, there's a lot of challenge of trying to uh, make sure that you can grab employees uh, early on and provide some sort of benefits to them that far outweigh the flexibility of some of these other uh, networks that, that have popped up. I think even anecdotally, in my experience, there have been a lot of times where I will get into an Uber or Lyft, they'll actually ask the driver uh, how long they've been driving and what they were doing before. And a surprising amount of the time, they'll, they'll tell me, yeah, yeah, I used to work at a, um, you know, at a, at a QSR uh, restaurant or used to work in restaurant retail and I decided that this was going to be a little bit better. So I think, um, um, I think the biggest challenge for them is going to be continuing to sort of staying top of mind as to what is the entry point uh, for somebody um, in this profession. How can they get started here? How do you keep them there? How do you keep them engaged? I think that's going to be a big, uh, a big challenge kind of moving forward. Awesome. All right. Thank you, guys. Let us let's dig in. So we'll drill down here on a fundamental issue. And, you know, we start to talk about touch on the topic of visibility. We talk about store and restaurant compliance. And whether it be compliance with brand standards, food safety protocols, limited time offers, new product rollouts, really this is looking at the degree to which every location is adhering to guidelines um, um, and this very much directly affects customer experience and store performance. So based on the research that we did, um, it seems there's a real common struggle here with compliance. Um, somewhat surprisingly, I guess in the extreme here, is less than one out of five restaurant operators told us that their stores were very effectively complying with operating procedures and key initiatives that were being rolled out by their corporate headquarters and by their franchisee um, headquarters. Um, among full service operators, interestingly, this figure drops even more to about one, only one in 10 in full service operators thought they were doing this. For um, limited service, it's a little bit better, one in four say that they're very effectively compliant. So Paul, maybe start just very simply, like how do you know which stores are in compliance with your operating procedures, the things you're, you're asking them to do? So as we go through any kind of product rollout or any different key initiative that we, we, we have within the, the world of QSR, before it used to be it required every one of our mid-management team members to visit all locations to verify everything was in place. And I would say now we've eliminated all of the unnecessary uh, driving back and forth with the implementation of, okay, here goes a form. It gets done at the restaurant level. We have photo and or video verification based off of whatever the, the initiative is. And at a glance, myself, uh, the operator, and our uh, CEO can easily see which restaurants are in compliance with what we're trying to achieve. And it's measurable, which is the biggest thing for us, is being able to make sure that we are getting the most out of our mid-management staff and out of what the initiative is at the restaurant, we could easily see how quick they're progressing, or we could easily see restaurant X has not finished completing whatever the said initiative is. And how can we go in, instead of going to 24 different restaurants, we just go to restaurant X 
and assist that restaurant with executing whatever that initiative is. Great. Maybe I'll just to kind of drill down on that, Paul. When they're not complying, like that store X, that once you've identified, how do you fix it? How do you change behavior? So we go back and we analyze, okay, is this a training issue or is this just a personality issue? So once we could identify it's a, it's, a, it's a training issue, we'll come back in and we'll say, okay, let's go through whatever the procedures are to launch said new product. So we'll go through what those procedures are. We'll make sure that once those procedures are in place, there'll be more verifications that come on the back end of it. So correcting a problem on our end is more identifying what the root cause is to ensure that we could avoid it from occurring in the future. Great. That may, may make sense. Thank, thanks, Paul. Uh, so Vlad, I guess the conversations you're having experience with our customers, um, how do you see, what are some of the, um, kind of what's the state of compliance and what are some of the challenges that, uh, that our customers have getting visibility into who's complying and then what are they doing about it? Yeah, I think there's uh, the, the challenges as a sort of, especially um, uh, from, a, um, uh, from a government perspective, as things continue to sort of increase from a compliance kick, I think we've seen this in the state of New York and the requirements and making for uh, the way that uh, you deal with even uh, uh, scheduling uh, employees uh, makes, it, makes it more difficult and makes it more necessary to have some sort of uh, processes, workflows, technology in place uh, to get on top of it. Uh, but I think the, the, a lot of the a lot of the industry today hasn't has benefited from um, really kind of uh, uh, great advantages over the years that's let them grow to be uh, pretty sizable businesses and hasn't had the necessity to go do that. So you're seeing a big transition uh, within the customer, but within within the industry itself, of trying to move to some of these tools. Um, so I, I'd say I think. Uh, relevant to what Paul said at the moment, it's uh, it's trying to get a hold of it. It's trying to find one more piece of change management that you can uh, push in to um, uh, to adopt a new technology, to find ways to kind of improve it piece by piece because it's coming from a lot of different fronts, be it around food safety, it's, it's food safety around labor, uh, around even some of the customer stuff that's happening with, uh, from the franchisor side uh, as well. All right, great. Okay, so let us... As I, as I promised, it kind of touched on visibility. Let's hit visibility kind of head on. Um, and specifically, we're going to try to get at, like, to what degree do you have visibility to the quality of work being done in each location? How are you getting that visibility? So in the research, we asked a range of questions uh, to get a handle on this, you know, the visibility challenge. And specifically, I put one statistic out that I thought was a little glaring on the topic of food safety. And the survey revealed a pretty big concern um, Seem, maybe this isn't so surprising that 88% of restaurant operators agreed that a customer food safety issue could put their business at risk and would lead to a negative sales impact. Not too surprising. I think we could all see the correlation there. Yet, despite the fact that nine out of 10 felt that this is a big concern, only one out of three operators feel really confident that their org would be able to identify a food safety concern before it became an issue, right? And it kind of begs a question like, okay, well, how are they getting visibility today? So we asked that question. So a core part of the visibility issue, it seems to be maybe stem from how they're getting visibility. And in the survey, it seems that almost half the operator is still using very traditional means, right? Whether that's phone calls and text, right? You can imagine messages going back and forth to try to say, hey, what's going on? Did you fix the issue? Give me the update. Um, and only, only 20% today, um, have indicated that they're using software to try to crack this nut around visibility. So, um, maybe we'll open up to either one of you. Are you surprised by this this food safety stat that only one out of three are very confident that they can get um, visibility? Paul, I'll, I'll let you speak to it. You're the industry expert. Yeah, so I, I definitely want to chime in on this one. So uh, this stat does not surprise me whatsoever, and I think it's more uh, when you operate in an antiquated way where your pen and paper or your, you're dependent upon a phone call or a text, things are not as fluid and they will never work the way you want them to work because somewhere along the line, someone's going to drop the ball. This is where leveraging technology is definitely a big plus within any uh, restaurant industry that you're in or any platform that you're in. So I would give you guys a operator specific initiative that we have. We implemented a food safety check using the platform of Zenput. And we were able to easily identify just by taking simple measurements, uh, uh, temperature checks across multiple coolers or freezers, 
And the minute something is off, our in-house team, uh, our teams of techs that go out and repair things, our facilities team, they automatically get a notification that freezer at restaurant X is not meeting temperature or cooler at restaurant Y is out of range. That prompts them immediately to contact the restaurant to see if they could do some troubleshooting over the phone. And if that, if they aren't unable to satisfy the need for a food safety check, they go out to the restaurant and correct the issue on site. We have been part of Zenput for almost six months now, and we have seen a drastic change in just making sure that our equipment is in well working order. Because generally speaking, when you have a food safety issue, 80% of the time there's an equipment problem. 20% of the time it's generally speaking, it's training issues. So leveraging technology here is exactly what will help operators avoid being unconfident that, they, that their restaurants are in any kind of food safety uh, concern whatsoever. That's great, Vlad. Any, as you kind of think about stories that you've heard or how experiences that operators are yeah, having, I'll, 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 I'll piggyback off of uh, this one uh, for what Paul was referencing. Um, I think there are two kind of two big areas, right? Uh, to the point that you're um, uh, talking about the visibility side and equipment failures and um, uh, or potentially some of these other things on the food safety front. We've started to do a little bit of work on the IoT side. And I think um, even our early, uh, we had about 15 folks, uh, beta test, 15 customers beta testing the product. I believe it was like 10 of them. Uh, over the course of the first couple months uh, had gotten ahead of, um, you know, refrigerator going down over the weekend or at night, or in one case, 15 minutes after somebody had left, uh, had left the restaurant and just closed it up, went and drove back and ended up saving two or $3,000. Uh, worth of inventory. I, I think the future, we'll talk about this a little bit later in the presentation, but I think the future as it applies on the, um, on the, on the visibility side has to really deal with two fronts. Um, one is around better, um, better logging data um, as it applies specifically to, uh, to temperatures, to sensors, to environments uh, within that control the food. And then two is frankly, um, you know, the camera, right? Uh, we take a lot of photos uh, uh, throughout the day I mean, heck, I, even my own family, we probably take 15, 20 photo, photos a day of the kids, um, um, whatever it is that they're doing. And we're starting to, we leverage that a lot in our work environment. Uh, but I think um, from the photo perspective, I'll give everyone a little small statistic. One out of every eight things that gets done in Zenput gets done with a photo attached to it, right? And so that visibility gives you instant views into how somebody's seen something, how they're observing it. It gives you moments in time where you can train them, give them some feedback on it, or potentially, uh, uh, turn around and create some other action item off of it. That's great. Um, thank you both. Um, I want a quick reminder um, as we're kind of reaching, uh, we have um, the, the final leg here, a few more questions here from me um, to please do feel free um, to put your questions in the uh, the chat window um, and we'll, we'll get to those shortly. So let us move on to a big topic, productivity. So given some of the macro execution barriers that we covered up front, rising wages, high turnover, you know, this is probably ultimately maybe the most important topic. Like how do you get more productivity out of the staff that you do have, right? Um, get more out of every field employee, which is Paul kind of spoke to it. How do you get more out of every store employee and ideally with an eye on getting them focused on higher value work as you implement technology to get them out of mundane tasks. So as a backdrop for this conversation, um, we had a ton of really intriguing insights um, on productivity that jumped out of the survey. I, I kind of pulled a few of them here. You know, in a nutshell, you know, it's there's a kind of consensus here, right? Almost everyone, you know, 82% feel that too much productivity has been gobbled up by lower value tasks, right? I think on the call, we can all relate to that. This one a little more surprising, um, and it's around audit specifically in the field. Operators are estimating that over 30 hours were being used up every week on the audit process. And this is if you take into account not just conducting the audit, audit which takes up a good amount of time in some cases, but it's also preparing reports based on the audit results. And it's all the follow-up on corrective actions, chasing down to see, hey, was this fixed? And maybe it is, back to our early conversation, maybe it, because it's using some old means of doing so, phone calls and texts, faxes, who knows. So the implication here is that it's leaving less than 10 hours a week for your district managers and field leaders to have um, to dedicate to to 
you know, higher impact activity, whether it's training or coaching, personal growth, other organizational initiatives. Um, so not surprisingly, when you shift your eye to the right of the slide here, when we ask operators what initiatives they're prioritizing in 2020, number one on the list was improving employee productivity. So that is the setup. I'm gonna go to this slide. Um, um, Paul, but this, this slide just kind of sets the table and it's really kind of driving home. There's lots of things you could do to increase productivity across the operation, whether it's in the restaurant, whether it's in the field, whether it's in headquarters. So Paul, let me turn to you. What are some of the tangible things that you've done to drive productivity gains? And maybe you can talk to, you know, at the restaurant level and then at, in the field. So let's we'll start off with the restaurant level on, on our end. First and foremost, it's important to know who our current employee is. And with our current employee base, we have to make sure that we simplify things as much as possible. And again, this is where I'm not trying to be a cheerleader here for Zenput, but this is where implementing this platform really help engage because this is what our current employee is accustomed to working through. We're able to eliminate the mundane tasks uh, that are day-to-day -day tasks that were just simply probably being pencil whipped on on the old check forms um, through Redbook or whatever service you are using. So just by eliminating so many of these tasks, we're able to see right away how much more productive our shift managers are within the restaurants and how how much they engage more with the initiative that we're pushing forward as an organization. From a general manager's perspective, having those food safety checks, equipment checks, and everything that enables them not to leave the restaurant, for example, within our, within our organization, there's so much that is done now electronically that they don't have to leave the restaurant in order to submit a uh, workman's comp claim or in order to get an employee to orientation to get them hired into the, to the restaurant. So we, we've been able to digitize all of that and that's increasing their efficiency as tenfold easily. And within our mid-management staff, they're able to see at an overview which restaurant is not able to complete their priority tasks. So for example, doing dining room checks or doing restroom checks, doing the things that keep our business fluid and operating in a very productive manner. So I, I feel as though just by implementing something that is more engaged something that our employees engage better with, we're seeing a lot of these other items uh, just kind of fall into place. And again, you know, we've been on this, we've been on Zenfoot for six months and we couldn't be happier with what we're seeing so far. And if I'm correct, our, our adoption rate has been right at 70% across the 24 restaurants. So we've been very happy with the increased productivity and not seeing all of those odd and end things that you would always wait on to get done or whatever the case may be getting done. So from a high overview point of view, our main office, we could see if a task gets assigned, okay, the task got assigned to the district manager, they got assigned, we have verification relatively instantly that the task was completed. We're able to sit down and have one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with the individuals over why they did or did not meet the objective target and or why they did not get the completed task done on a timely manner. So overall, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a definite drop in just the lack of wasted time. And now we've gotten more productive time out of our, out of our employee base. Uh, and, and, and Paul, did you, uh, did you know, you said um, you've got some numbers for uh, some of the impact on that in terms of our percentages or hours. Uh, that you've seen across the board or, or still maybe um, you feel it but not necessarily quantified it as much so we could actually quantify at the restaurant level uh, there's a task that we have set to be done 24 hours a day believe it or not and after going through and meeting with our our pilot restaurants we identified that you know we don't need this task done 24 hours a day and now we we've brought it down to six hours a day so mm -hmm. right off the top we saved 18 hours in just wasted wasted task time um, across the board. From our general manager's perspective, some of the maintenance tasks that they would try to get done on their own, they've been able to now utilize, uh, for instance, simple things as far as changing out AC filters or doing uh, restroom checks. They're able to hand that off to someone that 
is obviously not making as much as they are in order to make sure that those items are getting done. And it's, again, they don't have to be on hand to do it because they're getting the notification and or verification via email that this task was, was completed with a photo or with the video that the task said task was completed. So we we are seeing the labor savings across the board. There's there's no doubt about it whatsoever. Yeah, you just uh, you hit on one of my favorite points is that um, th these things sort of uh, uh, build up to be a lot. You know, people people sometimes think that uh, the productivity doesn't have the biggest impact, but usually actually does have the biggest impact. You think about a four or five percent reduction uh, in your own uh, workload throughout the week that can save you, you know, out of 40 hours, that will save you two hours a week. Uh, but the, the amazing thing is um, that that five percent uh, impact across the board of an organization your size. I mean, you're talking about potentially. You know, either uh, reducing headcount by uh, by 85 folks, I think across 1,700, or better yet, almost opening a whole store um, uh, off of that productivity uh, for free on the labor side. So, um, I, the 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 productivity gains uh, that we see as a as a society on a regular basis and within our own businesses, I think, is just uh, uh, really instrumental. And I, I if I if I may sort of step a little bit further out, uh, typically uh, in, increased productivity is the number one driver. Of, uh, of the GDP and the economy, right? So the, the more ways you can find to remove something else to keep doing higher order work, the better off uh, the business becomes uh, over time. I think none of us would go back to fax and, and sending letters uh, today if we, uh, if, even if you paid us to, uh, we're, too, uh, we're too set in the, in the new ways of productivity of using uh, cell phones and other technology. I do miss getting mail though. <laughs> <laughs> Running so awesome. if I could just add, if I could add one other thing to that, Vlad, because you brought up a really good point. It's not that we've shaved those those 18 hours. From yep. our perspective, it's more important that we're able to use those 18 hours a day to impact the guests and increase guest frequency within our restaurants. So instead of my my staff running around doing these odd tasks that were probably, if they were doing them 100%, uh, were were barely getting done. And now I'm able to have those same individuals impacting the guests at 18 additional hours a day. So we're increasing our top line by making the employee a lot more productive and not doing wasted tasks. Yep, yep, couldn't agree more, yep. Okay. All right, great. All right, so let's do a home stretch. Let's, gentlemen, I wanna get out our crystal balls. Oh, actually, I'm not gonna get a crystal ball yet. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to read a little bit of research just to kind of share with folks. Um, but I think we hit on the automation. You, you get both of you hit on the automation um, a little bit. Um, and I want to just give the time that we have. I want to talk a little bit about projecting forward. Um, on automation forward, it kind of, you can't have a productivity discussion until you're really talking about automation, embracing technology to kind of get rid of some of this manual work. So from just from the survey, just to, to share with folks on the call here. We did see a relatively small minority. We had you know, close to 30% saying that they're already embracing automation to a large degree. Doesn't mean you have many folks that are embracing to some degree. Um, but you know, on the you know, glass half full here, the ones that have jumped into the automation in a very meaningful way, they're seeing, they're seeing results. The vast majority, you know, over 80%, really they're having a very positive experience. I um, mean, the research that we're gonna release in, in uh, January, we're, we've done, um, we've correlated this, this group this uh, cohort of people embracing automation, and then everybody else who can really see across a range of topics and initiatives, you can see this group performing much better. Um, so that was a really interesting um, overall insight jumping out of the research. So the future, I, got, I told you, I promised you my crystal ball, there it is. <laughs> um, Paul, let's start with you. Um, if you could make a prediction, I'll even let you make two predictions if you got it around major change to how you think you're running your operation, if you would say two year, one to two years from now, and if you want to project even further, like three to five years from now, what might that be? So I would say the, the biggest change that we look for, or we're looking to, uh, to accomplish here within the next two years within our organization is embracing the automation and embracing more technology as we move forward. The work field is definitely getting challenged out there, the, the employee field. And we're looking at how we could continue to simplify what we have in place and using products such as Zenfoot are, are assisting us with getting that accomplished. Because as we, as we move uh, ahead here in the next couple of years, 
we just know it's going to be more technology based on what's what's happening within not just our field but across the spectrum great thank you for sharing that vlad yeah i think i would um i think i would echo a little bit uh, uh with paul's sentiment right i think the um, the reality is that there's there's pressure coming in from not just one side but two and three sides uh, within the industry um, uh, across the board. I think it becomes difficult if you don't find ways to kind of extrapolate out the, the mundane work um, and find ways to automate some of this. It's going to be a big key component. I do think that there will be uh, additional challenges around the delivery segment and ultimately how this sort of um, how how operators get back to um, get into a situation of trying to deal with the fact that you know a big portion of the business might be running in and out of the restaurant picking up and delivering for somebody else how's it going to play out with some of the ghost uh, the cloud kitchens or the ghost kitchens uh, that are being put uh, put out there today i think that's going to be um, an interesting sort of development over time and we've seen different models folks opening up um, you know ghost restaurants or cloud restaurants in certain areas uh, taking uh, a portion of an area and trying to make sure that's a pickup only um, but i think it'll be um, it'll be it'll be worthwhile to kind of see and it'll be worthwhile to kind of uh, uh, to, uh, to watch as, uh, as time moves on. All right, great. Thank you both for that. Um, so let's say we're, we're, let's go to Q&A here. Um, so we have just a few minutes left. So I, uh, there's a lot of questions come in. I'm going to try to, I've been charting out, try to see if we can hit three of them. Um, so we'll start, I'm going to pick a couple that are a little bit more tactical and then we'll rise up. So one is it's a very fair question. Someone's asking, you know, we're looking to um, take away a lot of mundane tasks from people in their stores. You implement a tool, uh, other tools, and in this case, we're talking about Zenput. What is, what is, uh, how do you prevent frontline staff from considering using use of Zenput as a new mundane task? Like to the, those in the front line, is, is this just setting up a, a whole series of um, steps that they need to take throughout the day that they feel might be getting in the way um, of what they're, their normal way of doing work. So Vlad, I don't know what you might, um, Paul, your experience or Vlad kind of looking across customers and how they, that change management. Paul, I'll let you take a stab at it first, then I'll very much your sense. Okay, so, sounds great. So how do you make sure that that the Zenfoot or the tablet or the device is not just being used as the previous pen and paper? Uh, the first thing that we did within our organization was we identified key restaurants that could help us narrow down what was being put out versus what was actually needed. Um, then within that, we set up parameters and timeframes with this particular application input that allows us to know, okay, um, said task got done within too quick of a time frame. So that's an indication that it was probably pencil whipped. And if we come across that, we sit there and we, we address it with said shift manager or general manager. But I, I feel as though if you get a good team of people around you, identify what is needed versus what you have, you're going to be able to realize right away a lot of what you have is truly unneeded, and that alone will, will get this particular uh, tool to be extremely useful. Out of the 24 restaurants that we have right now, if I were to go to them and say, hey, we are no longer using this product, I think I would have mutiny on my hands because they have all embraced it, and more so, not only the fact that they've embraced it, but more so because it, this is what our current employee wants in their hands. They don't want a pen and paper. They want a tablet. They want a phone. They want a monitor. They want something that engages them into doing their day-to-day -day task. Um, yeah, I think uh, in in my case, I'll, I'll sort of uh, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on uh, today, and then also look forward a little bit if you guys if. Uh, if the person asking the question doesn't mind and the rest of the audience. Um, uh, so I think from a high level starting point, um, you need to meet the, uh, the end user where they're at. And the reality is that we all spend uh, the majority of our times on our, our mobile phones these days. So I think at a minimum, there is an expectation, a little bit more engagement that ends up happening because you're doing something on mobile and you're doing something that people are used to, uh, uh, used to doing on a regular basis, taking photos, swiping things left and right, um, and kind of meeting them at the point to where they're acting. That inadvertently allows you to cut back significantly on what Paul just mentioned on some of the work that you were previously doing um, that you may um, that you just may not need anymore uh, by virtue of uh, using technology. I think the second point is, uh, this is really kind of more of an internal thing that uh, we talk about. Um, we're starting to spend a lot more time to uh, find more fun ways 
uh, to engage with the frontline worker that uh, we'll probably uh, be rolling out in the future uh, of ways to make sure that uh, they find it engaging, um, kind of keeping them on their toes a little bit of the work that they want to do. So I think there'll be some fun stuff that we'll be doing within the roadmap uh, to kind of continue to uh, boost that engagement up and making sure that even two, three, four years into using our product um, and using our platform that you're getting the kind of uh, engagement numbers that you'd expect. Great. Okay, one more uh, maybe bite-sized tactical one. So for those, um, I'm going to extrapolate with a couple of questions that have come in, uh, coming on the topic of shifting from, from the old world to the new. Um, so if you are kind of a pen and paper organization and, and, you're, and you have an appetite to say we're going to move to the next level um, and implement technology like Zenput, um, how long does it take to do that? Um, so maybe, Paul, in your experience when you were rolling out Zenput, how long did it take to... Uh, to deploy to your uh, to the 24 stores, um, and then Vlad maybe broad, more broadly, how what's experienced customers have? Okay, so I think that's a really great question. Uh, so when you go from this um, paper and pen platform uh, to a digital one, you'll be surprised how quick your your restaurant managers and your restaurant teams will adapt to it. Uh, it took us roughly a three week. Uh, lead to get all restaurants online and actively using uh, this particular platform. We we did our 14-day trial. After we did our 14-day trial, an additional two weeks to get all 24 restaurants on. And when we did our 14-day trial, it was only a, a couple of restaurants that did that particular trial. So you'll be surprised how quick um, your employee base picks up on this on this particular product. Great. So, oh, did you want to uh, comment on that? No, I, th I think um, uh, probably best is coming from Paul, but uh, we, we try to spend as much time as possible uh, being uh, partners in this and making sure that uh, deployment's quick, the technology's quick, um, and that uh, the, the change management that you have to go through on your side uh, is, is minimized by uh, working with us and making sure that we can share best practices on, on what makes the most amount of sense. Great. Okay. So, the final question before we wrap, uh, as promised, I'm going to rise way up. Um, someone had asked, about retention. So with all with all the turnover um, experiencing and the cost of labor, how do you, what are some techniques, what are some uh, initiative strategies being used to uh, to retain employees today? So Paul, maybe from Arthur Foods perspective, what are some of the things you're doing, which might, may span topics that we haven't covered today in terms of how you're approaching yeah. it. So how we approach employee retention, um, we have a lot of different a lot of different markets within within Central Florida here. Uh, our biggest thing is the training piece and how we get employees to commit to staying long term with us. So once you come in the door with us, uh, you are hand in hand put with someone at the restaurant level, and we really work on building that relationship with with you and the restaurant as you come in. Uh, we offer great employee incentives and packages, but at the end of the day, the only way you're going to work on retaining employees from our perspective is how you make employees feel upon arrival and how you keep them engaged in what the initiatives are within your restaurant in particular or whatever your field may be. So employee retention, it's going to be a battle that we all face with the low employee rate, employment rates right now, unemployment rates right now. Uh, I would just highly recommend seeing how you're inviting the employee in the door because if they don't feel good when they walk in, they're not going to want to stay with you. And just always remembering, people, do, people never quit their job. They generally quit their boss and or how they feel in a certain environment. Oh, Paul, you just hit on one of my favorite, uh, favorite folks. Is you're, you're absolutely right. It's uh, it, it's never the job itself, or just about never. It's always the manager, um, and it's always the feeling that they get. This is why culture is so important uh, from the start. Um, I, I think um, in a lot of ways, um, perks and the additional benefits are um, are nice. But the reality is that the things that um, uh, the things that are free are sometimes also a little bit harder to pull off, which is caring about somebody. It's asking them how their day is going. It's making sure that when there's a hot button item, you're not um, um, you're not letting it boil over. You have a sit a sit down a normal conversation with somebody and try to explain it to them. People appreciate that. I think people appreciate that more than uh, more than the uh, additional things on on top of it, um, uh, where the other ones might be more expensive. Um, 
uh, and there's more money associated with them, they're actually um, easier to go get because you can just buy them. Uh, so yeah, I, I do believe that uh, the, the focus on culture, the focus on making sure that uh, the, even from the day one, that onboarding experience feels phenomenal, um, but not forgetting what does day 90 look like and day 180 and day 365, right? Um, those are those are important uh, important parts within a, uh, within the life cycle of the team member and the organization. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you both. So Cassie, um, I guess we'll hand back to you to wrap. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, for taking the time to join us today. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone. And we'll be following up via email with a replay of the webinar. And if you have any questions, feel free to continue to submit them in the questions pane and we can follow up offline. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Oh.